Okay, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to be here. First time in Odessa. Looks wonderful. Um, I'm Marco. Um, I'm deeply sleep deprived. I didn't sleep tonight. It's my fault, mostly because I'm an idiot. Um, on the internet, you may know me as this guy. Um, if you know the nickname, that's probably already bad. If you see this, run. It's not a good idea to stay around. Um, I have a very bad reputation for being very strict when it comes to code reviews and checking other people's code. That doesn't mean that I bite. I try to give useful feedback. Um, I'm a consultant. I work for a company called Rove. Um, right, let me just move this down, right? Otherwise, I'm breathing into it. Okay, so uh, we are consultants. What do we do? Um, we come to your company, we take all your money, and then we spend it on going to conferences, which, yeah, pretty much works out well. I'm part of the Zen Framework team, um, so if you're using Zen Framework stuff, come and talk to me, um, especially Expressive and all the new fancy stuff. And I'm part of the Doctrine team, so I help maintaining the ORM and helping making the PHP world a bit slower. Um, Sorry. Yes, I know everyone is basically using it. Um, even Laravel is using Doctrine under the hood anyway. So, okay. Um, this talk is Extremely Defensive PHP. Um, it's called Extremely Defensive PHP because I'm an extremist. Now, don't worry, I don't have a bomb. Okay, I'm not that kind of extremist. Um, I'm just pushing the limits always. And the point is that I became an extremist. I've never, I, I, I didn't go this way before actually starting doing open source. The problem is that I have way too many packages. So um, a few days ago, I tried to ask somebody, how do I count the packages that I ha have access to on GitHub? And I didn't actually find a way to do it, so I did it by hand. And it's, 27, it's, it's 217, not 2017, that would be too much. 217 packages, that's libraries that I have to jump in and help out when something happens. And that's way too much. And yesterday I deprecated one, so that's 20, uh, 216, sorry. Um, yeah, the point is that everyone wants a new feature. Everyone is like, like my feature, my issue, it's, it's my thing, it's important, I need it tomorrow. I need to go live, production, deployment, whatever, I don't care. It's MIT, it's your problem. MIT means it is your problem, okay? You use it, if you want, you can hire me. Um, so the point is that we are full of feature creeps. This is the creep, anybody know the Lonely Island? Yeah? Um, we all want something more. Something nicer that does this, does that, does coffee in the morning, wakes you up, you know, pampers you, whatever. Um, so the point is we want to limit that because it causes issues. So this talk is about aggressive practices that very much fit projects that are long-lived. So things that you want to maintain in two, three months, or six years, or ten years, or whatever. Uh, so if you are doing open source, any kind of open source, then remember that your project is going to have an infinite lifespan. Okay? Once you release it, somebody will use it. Somebody will love it for it. Somebody will hate you for it. Okay? And this happens all the time. But once it's released, it's out there. There is no, ah, I don't care, or, you know, I, it only fit my use case scenario, and I didn't think that they would use it that way. Every perceived usage of the package is the public API. So it doesn't matter if you thought that's what the documentation says and there we stop it. You have to actually be much more strict because people are going to abuse the stuff you, you, you built. So you need to know your limits. This is not for your weekend project. This is not for the landing page that is going live tomorrow and staying up for a month. You don't care about that. You know, like you can just really code the trashiest code ever. It's okay. But if you have something that lives longer, you should apply this stuff, at least in my opinion. So if you don't agree with them, don't apply them. But please, please be very careful about what you put out there. So just because you have it doesn't mean that you have to show it to everyone. Okay? Um, so let's start in a bold way. You're dumb. Uh, 
So, uh, I, I think that's the wrong slide. Okay, no, sorry. Um, sorry, uh, I don't think that's the right slide. Um, I am dumb. Um, I'm a human being. I have limits. I have a brain that is relatively small compared to, you know, an elephant or whatever. And we still don't use much of it. And honestly, a lot of people don't even know how to use it. Um, yeah, and I think within the constraints of my experience, of my current circumstances, of my emotions, of what is happening around me. So the decisions I do, I take, do not necessarily apply for everything in the future. The point is that we are all dumb. We all have this limitation. We have to think not just about what is now, but we have to be a bit more careful about what we build. Engineering is about making things safe to use and very stable for everyone. It's not about smashing out stuff and pushing shit to production, okay? That's not engineering. That's just like, you know, smashing things together and pushing to production. That's a cloaca maxima. Um, so the point is that everyone is dumb, okay? And um, those that have the best words, the, everyone loves their words and they're great and whatever, they're probably the dumbest, okay? So first of all, you have to admit your limits. So the other thing that you probably are not aware of, I don't know if this is just common, but I've been pretty scared about how people drive here, um, is defensive driving. Anybody know what defensive driving is? Heard of it? Defensive driving? Okay. Well, defensive driving is what Audi drivers don't do. Okay. Uh, the idea is that you are one step ahead. So you are thinking about what is going to happen. A ball is going to roll on the road. There's going to be an ice plate. There's going to be a hole. There's going to be a deer crossing the road. Uh, I don't know. The bridge is going to end. Whatever. So you're thinking at least three seconds ahead of what is going to happen. You're not like reacting all the time to the second. You're always looking a bit forward, a bit there, a bit there, a bit back, and not doing anything stupid. So defensive coding is pretty much like defensive driving. So you are being aware of what you are producing as code, about what you're consuming as code. You're trying to stay within the constraints of what is documented, about what is stable and known, API, you're not using something obscure that may break because nobody told you about it, but you just found it. Um, and you need to be cautious about not just what you import, but also about your stuff. Because you yesterday, you tomorrow, and you today are different people. You're thinking differently. You're reasoning differently. You may as well have written code six months ago. That code may have been written by another person, and there would be no difference whatsoever. That's pretty much it. So, some references. The stuff that I'm teaching here and I'm showing you, doesn't. it's not stuff that I invented. I didn't invent anything here. This stuff comes from books and from previous practices and from languages where this stuff is very well known, where this stuff is already accepted and everyone knows that you should do it that way. But in PHP, we're kind of slow at learning. So the first book that I, book that I really like is this code complete. Anybody read this? Yeah, a few people. So this is um, a very, very outdated guide on how to write good code. So this book was from a, an, a time in which people would tell you, oh, this function is only two pages long. That's not so bad. OK? And nowadays, it's like, dude, your function is more than five lines. You should probably refactor it. Um, still. That was a good direction. This book was about naming variables, naming functions, making things understandable for others, which was complete far west before that. Nobody gave a shit before, OK? The other book that I really like is this one, Effective Java. I don't use Java for work. I would love to. I think it's a great language, honestly. Um, it has a lot of potholes, but it's still better than PHP. Don't get me wrong. Um, and this book is a manual on how to make bugs in Java. So you can find any kind of bug in here. Race conditions, null pointer exceptions, how to trigger a JVM bug, how to, you know, anything you want. You go in here, you find it. So this book gives you an idea of how many things can go wrong in a completely different language, but you still bring it into PHP. When you think about PHP, you're like, ah, yeah. 
these things, they can happen. I didn't think about them. So, more concepts. Another concept that I want you to familiarize it, uh, familiarize with is Pokayoka. Anybody heard of Pokayoka before? Yeah? Now, I hope nobody speaks Japanese because what I'm saying is probably bullshit, but the idea of Pokayoka is that you want to avoid mistakes or also foolproof something. So the idea is when you go to Ikea, I don't know if you have Ikea here, but if you go to a shop and you buy something that you need to put together, if you buy some Lego or something like that, you just click them together. They should click. There should be no like uh, 45 degrees and a half and stuff like that. It should just click together. It should be easy to use. There should be an intuitive way of making it work. So one example is this one. This is an RJ45 cable. Has anybody managed to plug it in upside down? There is always one. No? Nobody? Well, you can do another funny thing about this. You can make an ether killer. So you plug this one on one side. On the other side, you plug in the 20, uh, 220 volt. And then you plug it in, and you see the routers pop. Um, it's a good way to get fired. So the point is, this one goes in only one way. You can plug it in upside down, but you really need to be a Hulk to do that, right? You need to be a monster. Um, it is designed to plug in one way. It also does a nice click, so you know when it's done, and you don't need to worry. You know it works. You, even, even a monkey can do that. On the other hand, there's this device. <laughs> this device comes from, a, from, well, from another dimension. So it, it works in, I don't know, with some quantum physics. So you try, plug it in, doesn't work. Plug it in upside down, doesn't work. You turn it upside down again, and, uh, and then it's like, it, it works. There's some, some quantum physics, quantum locking, you know? Maybe that's how supercomputers are made. I can imagine supercomputers. It's all USB-A plugs inside them. So that's probably not so good design. So this is the difference between good Pokayoke. This is Pokayoke. This is not Pokayoke. Why? Because you know exactly how it goes in, right? That's the difference. Pokayoke should be, oh, I see it, I understand. There is no need for documentation. It's go, it goes so easy that you don't need documentation. Yes, you will need some, but that's the point. Another concept that I want to make pretty much clear is that code is reusable, right? You all agree on that, right? Wrong. Code is not reusable. Code is shit. Okay? A developer's job is to think. Then at the end of the day, some of that thinking may have been turned into code. But it doesn't mean that all of the code should be written. Okay? Because as soon as you wrote it, it has bugs. On average, every 10 lines of code, you will have at least two bugs, maybe three. Okay? And that's normal. That's not because you're stupid, that's just because code is shit. It's an imperfect representation of our thought, of our thinking process, of our algorithm put in a language. And even if you make the perfect piece of code, remember that below it you have maybe two million lines of the Linux kernel running it. How many bugs are in there? Okay? So it's not just your code. At some point, the network will fail, something else will fail, something will crash, something will overflow, the CPU will overheat, the RAM will you know, lose bits somewhere because you didn't pay ECC RAM and whatever. Um, so the point is that 90% of everything is crap. You shouldn't be attached to code. Code is not that important. Um, and if it is perfect code now, it will probably be shit code in a couple of years because the coding practice has changed. Every year we invent some new way of, you know, inducing pain in ourselves to produce better code. That's what we say. Well, it is actually getting better. That's okay. But it is indeed changing. If you look at, I don't know, Symfony 1.4 or Zen Framework 1, Right? Who wants to work with Symfony 1 or Zen Framework 1 now? Right? But that was state of the art. Everyone was like, yeah, Symfony 1, Zen Framework 1, I'm using Zen Framework 1, I'm no, no longer smashing things together randomly. So what is reusable are the abstractions. So don't copy-paste code, don't reuse code. What you reuse are the abstractions. The abstractions are the protocols how pieces of code talk together, how machines talk together. TCP IP is a protocol. 
that defines how two machines are supposed to exchange information. And we pretty much live because of it, because otherwise, otherwise we would be out of a job. Okay, I think if TCP didn't exist, we wouldn't even have this conference. Um, that's an abstraction that you can reuse. Then you can invent as many network cards, as many cables, as many whatever you want, as you, as you want, but this is what is reusable. Protocols, interfaces, APIs, that's reusable. So that you can copy around and then you implement your own version. The point is you don't want to write code ahead, try to write as little code as possible and therefore write less crap. Because as soon as you write it, you have to maintain it. And maintenance is, amount, is an amount of work. Okay, so if you have a project and you start writing, 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 the second week, if you didn't test it, you're gonna be so slow because everything will have a bug in it. Everything. So, in order to reduce the amount of code, you code only for what you need now. So, let's take it in a bit of a simplistic way. Let's say you have a ticket or something that you need to fix, something that you need to do, build something. Do just that. Don't build a spaceship because you need to, you know, open a bottle, right? You shoot a zapper from the spaceship, you know, photon torpedoes to open a bottle. That doesn't work. So you code for what you need to do now. You code for your use case, not for what you need to do later. You don't want to reuse the code. First you code it for now. The abstraction comes later once you know that the abstraction is there. Some good practices. So now I've been telling you about what not to do. Okay, some good practices. I'm going to assume that you know what solid is. It doesn't matter right now. If you don't know it, you can look it up. Solid is a uh, single responsibility, open closed, uh, list code substitution, what is it? Inversion of control? Yeah, and uh, anybody know the last one? Ah, integration, okay, and dependence injection, okay. Yeah, so effectively it's just a set of open, uh, of practices that we use to, you know, fix open um, object-oriented programming because object-oriented programming is kind of broken in the languages that we use. Um, and I'm going to assume some object calisthenics. This is a bit harder. Object calisthenics is a practice that you can learn over time, and it's about writing code in a very different way. So it's more like an exercise, because it enforces very strict rules, like a class, a class can only have two properties, right? And if an, one of the properties is an array, only that array can exist in the, in the class. And you cannot use two nested if conditions. And you cannot nest a for each, okay? And the public API must be limited. And the size of the class must be under 50 lines of code. It's really difficult to write code with object calisthenics. There's a code style by Guillermo Blanco if you want to use it. Give it a try. It's really hard to follow these rules, but they make you a better programmer once you know what the direction is. You don't need to get there, you just need to go into that, in, in that direction. So one thing that you can do immediately, besides these rules, is to use immutability to your advantage. So the point is, um, how many of you use a debugger? How many use it every day? Right, why? <laughs> I don't open the debugger, like I open it once a week. And usually I refuse to do it. Instead, I write a test until I understand the problem and I try to isolate it without the debugger, yes, because it's an exercise and because the code is probably shit and it needs to be refactored anyway. That's why I have a debugger open. So what you're looking for when you have a debugger open is state. What is this variable at this point? And why does this variable become this at this point? And the keyword is variable, and the keyword here is also state. So you have variable state, that's problems. So if you make state immutable, you pretty much reduce the set of bugs that you have. You know this comes in and this comes out, you know it got replaced. It, is, it did not change, it was completely replaced at some point. So it's much easier to detect where that happened. So one example of immutability that kinda got it right, it's not perfect, not by far, is PSR7. PSR7 is just one of the first specifications where finally the PHP community is understanding that holy crap, this immutability stuff works. It's not just bullshit. Um, 
and it is an example to follow, in my opinion. It's not perfect. It has some mutability in it, which makes it kind of flawed. But it is still a step in the, dire in the right direction. Uh, what you can do about performance, performance really in immutability in PHP are not that friendly with each other. Okay, So if you have immutability, you are going to have some overhead. But generally, you should profile. It doesn't matter what you say. A database query is going to be much slower than a 1,000 objects instantiated in memory and replaced. So you should really just profile and verify when things get over this threshold of complexity. So when you have a nonlinear function in complexity, right? well, you don't have a flat line, basically, in complexity, then you should worry about performance there. Since we want things to be immutable, we get rid of setters, especially on services. There is no need for setters. Setters are not the concept of object-oriented programming. Why? Because I don't go here and say, you are now yellow, you're green, and you're blue. It doesn't work like that. They're going to say, like, no, you just you color your own hair, you weirdo. It's not my issue. I can tell people what to do. I can't tell them what to be. That's a different thing. And that should apply to objects as well. So setters don't really mean anything. And you should remove them. Don't use them, period. And if you rely on some magic that needs the setters, get rid of it. It's a shit component, probably. It's a shit library. You don't need it. Um, the constructor becomes the only injection point. So for services, things that require other services, only the constructor is used. And that removes one other problem, which is uninitialized properties. Once you create an object, it's going to live like that, right? And you don't have properties with the magic null that changes at runtime. You don't have that anymore. That's less trouble. So one example of this is in optional dependencies. Anybody heard of this before? All right. Optional dependencies are massive trouble. So you install a package, then try to use a feature, and then it crashes because it has an optional dependency that you didn't configure. That's probably a bad idea. So uh, for example, in Zen Framework, this happened quite a lot. And it is arguably a terrible idea. We did it wrong, and we're fixing it. But it's taking us year to fix, years to fix it. Why? Because somebody's already using those libraries. So one example that we all kind of did is this one. We have a DB connection, has a constructor. Now I'm using a setter. Yes, I'm cheating to make it simple. But I think everyone at some point in their career wrote something like this. So we had a database class, and at some point we set a logger. And if the logger is set, then we are going to log stuff that is going through this database connection. And if it's not set, we're not going to do anything about it. So the point is optional dependencies do not exist. Either you have the dependency or you don't. There is no Schrodinger's dependency. There, there is no such thing. It's much easier to just always require dependencies and mock out or stub out things that you're not using. So for example, in a DB connection, you can just move the parameters here. You can have now a logger constructor right? in the constructor. There is no setters anymore. There is no mutation at runtime. And you just use a fake logger instead. Relatively simple. Nothing special about it. I think we all saw this. The other thing that you should do is avoid expanding the public API. So if you have a public API that you're not using that is not strictly necessary, you should get rid of it. Strictly necessary means that you have another way of doing the same thing with the same object. Okay, so don't give variation of the same API um, just out if it's not strictly needed. The problem is that a public method has to be maintained. Once you released it, it's out there. So it's, a public method is like a child. Once you've written it, you have to maintain it for the rest of its life. That's a lot of time. I can tell you, there's a lot of libraries out there that I would love to rewrite. You can't do that. There's companies relying on it. You're doing much more damage by replacing the library than by actually keeping the stuff that is broken in place and maybe fixing it, maybe. So just because you remove public methods and you reduce the public API doesn't mean that you have now one method with 50 parameters. Okay? Anybody use the OpenSSL extension in PHP? That's like 50 parameters, something like that. It's like, it's like a nightmare. If you make a combination of every parameter that you can pass in, there's probably less stars in the universe than in the OpenSSL parameters. Um, so avoid logic switch parameters. If you have 
an API that does this, an API that does that, right? And you just make one method with a true false that doesn't work. So here we have something as an example. We have a spammer class. The spammer sends some spam with an email, a template, and eventually an opt-out link. This is what I call a logical switch parameter, because this is changing what this thing does by a parameter. It's completely changing what it does. The intent is different. Now, what you do is, this is a case where you make two methods. So you have a send illegal spam and send apparently legal spam. Okay? Different methods, not the switch parameter. Why? Because every time we add one of those switch parameters, you're actually dumping complexity to the consumers of your API. Anybody tried, you know, if you go into your IDE and you want to figure out how many method calls of this use true and how many use false here? How do you do it? There's no way. It's just such a mess. It's really complicated to move, to handle BC breaks, so don't do it. Another thing that is relatively common in object-oriented programming is that all states should be encapsulated. So once you have some state, you want to keep it protected and prevent others from accessing it. So I'm making an example. I'm using a simplified example with a, with a setter. Okay. Does anybody see the bug here? What's the bug? Right. You should clone this. And the point is, what, you're, what you should do, the operation is called dereferencing. This is an object. It's passed in by reference. If you have a reference there, you are going to have a bug. Let's make, you, let's make an example. So you have a date time, which is the current time. You have a bank account one and bank account two. They do some, some operations. Yes, I use the setter as well. I'm keeping it simple there. Then stuff happens. 20 million lines of code are executed. Something else happens. The world changes. Doesn't matter. And then at some point, somebody does this. And suddenly, you changed not one, but two bank account information by just changing an ex another object. This is what we call a spooky action at the distance. And this is something that we do not want, OK? Except there is a programming language that is completely designed on this. Anybody know what it is? It's called CSS. CSS is designed around this concept. You change something here, and it breaks everything down there. It's not a good language, but it works for some stuff. So what you do is you clone it, or you use an immutable version. You can always use an immutable version. Simplifies so many things. You don't need to worry about it anymore. Just use the immutable version. Or make your, your own immutable version that dereferences stuff. So the same happens with constructor. Let's keep on that. External access. External access means you are reading and writing state or accessing APIs. Okay? External access also includes new subclasses. So if you write a new class that is a child class of your original one, so you're making it an extends, okay, that is a completely new scenario. You should not give access to this subclass to your properties. Why? Because it is unpredictable. It could change everything under the hood without you realizing it, and that could mean bugs. So that means make the properties private. Make every method you don't explicitly want to be accessed, make it private. Make use private by default. Private properties by default. Private methods by default. If you don't explicitly know 100% that this thing needs to be protected because I am exactly designing it to be protected. Don't make it protected. Okay. Some other stuff that you can do. Well, you need to consider any interaction with an object like a transaction. So if a method call will mutate the state of an object, like a bank account, you do something with a bank account, that interaction must be atomic, which means that if it throws an exception, if there is a failure, if something goes wrong, that object should still be in a consistent state. You should, you should still be able to operate with it. So let's make another example here. We have a function called add money. You add just some money to the internal array of money, whatever. We have many monies. Uh, and then you mark the bill paid with money. And then somewhere in another layer, you call two methods. You do an add money here and then mark bill, bill paid with money. So what happens is 
that these methods are in one interaction. This is one transaction. Okay, this is one thing that we're doing. We're just doing it with two method calls. What happens if this one works and this one crashes? So what happens is that we get the money, but we don't mark the bill as paid, which may be good for us, right? Not so much for your customer. Uh, but a lot can happen in there. So if this happens, you've got a problem because you're going to have inconsistent state in the middle of the execution. So it's much easier to just take out the money, mark bill paid with money, make them private, and have one method which is called pay bill that just mutates all the state it needs to do. And if something has to crash, it knows that it can revert the state. It knows that it can recover from this operation. So you just call it like that. Now you also have a very precise way of calling it. You say pay bill, which is not a person. Right. Another thing that I see often, don't assume that the methods that you call are idempotent, idempotent, I, I have no idea how to pronounce it. Um, that idempotent means you call it multiple times, they always give back the same result. And PHP has no way of guaranteeing it. It doesn't have a marker. It doesn't have a type check. There are languages where you can define that, where you can say this, is operation, this operation is pure, and it will always give me back potatoes when I input whatever. Right? Um, but in a language like PHP, this is not guaranteed. So what you usually see is something like this. So you have these two calls, where you're asking the controller to give me a request. And then you ask it to give me a parameter. There is no guarantee that these two always return the same one. They could return a different request. Could be intentional, could be a bug. Okay? But you need to be aware of that. So, relatively simple. Smash it into a variable, and that's it. It's not very complicated. A lot of people do it because of performance. That's not the problem. The problem is repeated method calls are problematic. So um, Vladimir Kalesil, I don't know what, what his last name is, um, he's making PHP EA inspections for IntelliJ and PHP Storm. And for example, it detects stuff like this. It says, look, you're repeating this method call. Are you sure? It doesn't look like a good idea. Assert. So you need to treat everything that comes from the outside world like poisonous, radioactive, it's going to kill you. Everything that comes from the outside is bad. Everything you're giving to the outside world is good, in theory, okay? Um, but you trust what you give out, you don't trust what you get in. Everything that comes from the outside that pa um, passes multiple layers, so from the outside world to your Nginx, to your Apache, to your uh, whatever you do to your middleware, to your controller layer, to your service layer, every time you jump in one layer, you're doing a translation. So from the outside world, you start from a network request. So first of all, you need to go through the firewall, and the firewall says, look, it's a valid request, so I'm passing it through. And then it goes through uh, the Symfony or whatever front end, and the Symfony front end says, oh, it looks like an HTTP request, I'm going to parse it and then it passes it over, and then you get parameters. And it looks, says, oh, look, it has post parameters, and it looks like the post parameters are in JSON, so I'm going to give you all the parsed JSON. And you jump in one layer more, and then you say, oh, look, this looks like a username payload. Okay, and so on and so forth. Every layer you jump in, you are casting it, you're converting it to a better type, and you're verifying that it is what it looks like. So what you do is you enforce any API that calls you should give you values that you, you first verify, you assert upon them. So I make this example generally to confuse people. So we have a train. A train receives a set of wagons. And before we assign wagons, we actually splat them. And we call a function that just type checks on them and just returns. OK, I just like this to confuse people, but effectively all I'm doing is if any of those is not a wagon, this thing crashes. And if the array that I have there is not indexed numerically, it's going to crash. This is by design. And by the way, yes, don't do this. Use a library. There's good libraries out there. There's uh, 
Benjamin Eberle's library. There's um, Web Mozart's library. Um, they work. Just use them. They give you meaningful error messages. But what you get from the outside world is to be considered unsafe. It's to be considered potentially wrong. Somebody will give you a parameter that doesn't look like what you have. And we are not in a strongly typed language, so we cannot guarantee that what we get from the outside is correct at compile time. So we need to add assertions in this language. This means no mixed parameters. So what you can see usually is an API like this. We have, well, I've been living in Germany for too long, so my examples are really not that happy. So we have a tri prisoner transfer request. Okay, and this prisoner transfer request has an access level, and this is an API that grew organically. Oh, geez, I'm gonna have to skip some stuff. So you start with false, and then it was false and true, and then at some point say, oh, now we need a third state, so we're gonna make null. Now we have another state, we can need 10, and then 20, and whatever. What the hell? What is this? This is very normal. You see it a lot. It's really easy. Take this stuff, make a value object out of it. You make a concept out of it. So this value object can now be constructed with true, false, null, 10, 20. And you have a type, and you can type hint against it. And this is awesome. Why? Because you can ask others to give you the value objects, and they only can use the constructors that you have on value objects, so they cannot give you something wrong. And if you return something, you will return a value object, so everyone can know what to expect. So you have consistency by type checks, you have validity, so when you validate an email address, you get an email address. You don't need to validate a string in every freaking layer. You have an object that just type checks there is no need to redocument it and revalidate it and retest it in every layer. This means also no mixed return types. Every time you are giving a mixed return type to your user, you're showing them the middle finger. That's not respectful of your users. That's not respectful, uh, respectful of users of your libraries. Do not return mixed. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. Do value objects again. Give them value objects. They will figure out how to use the accessors and the value objects. That's a much better way of doing it. A couple other things. Sadly, I don't have time. Fluent interfaces don't. There's no point in it. Why? Because these three things are the same thing, written in different ways. This is fluent. This is done fluent with a variable. This is just sequential method calls. Three ways to do the same thing. This goes against Pokayoke. We discussed it. One way of doing it. No discussion, no confusion. Just remove fluent interfaces. There's no point of doing that. The other thing I really suggest you look into, final classes. Make classes final. If you don't design a class to be extended, make it final first. You can always remove the final marker afterwards. But First, when you first write the class, make it final. Stop people from thinking, oh, I'm going to use inheritance to fix this problem. That's probably a bad solution anyway. There's a blog post for that, so you can look it up. Traits, we discussed it. Code is not reusable. Don't use traits. It's a bad idea. <laughs> no, it's serious. Don't use traits. There's no point in doing that. Um, it's much easier to make a public static function somewhere else. Really, you can take any trait and translate it into public static methods somewhere else. Take this exercise. Take any trait you want, make it a public static method somewhere else, or a function. You can write it. Traits are not a good idea. Don't use them. All right, so I'm going to skip over some stuff. Well, you can disable cloning. You can throw exceptions. You can't clone humans, not yet. I'm fairly sure in Ukraine you don't have these strict rules yet. Um, for serialization as well, my thing, don't, don't serialize it. You can't serialize the socket, you can't serialize PDO connection, so don't serialize stuff that you're not supposed to serialize. Unit testing, well, okay. Anybody know the crop score? Know the crop score? No? Oh, I told you code is crap. No, crop score, I don't know the acronym, is basically a ratio between the number of tests and the number of paths within your code. Actually, the opposite. So this number should be lower than two, which means you have more than one test for every if conditional. Okay? 
that's kind of the idea. Right. Yeah, geez. To recap, this stuff is suggestions from me. You're not forced to use them, but take them into consideration. Maybe look at this talk again, talk with it, uh, talk about it with your colleagues, discuss it, start a conversation about being stricter about code. Um, the far west of code does not work. Okay? Being stricter about the rules works. So let's try to do that. Trust no code. You don't take a piece of code and you use it. Right? Try to be a, a bit more sensitive about what you write and what you use. And keep things to a minimum. If you don't need a feature, and especially if you're not using it, you will not maintain it and there will be bugs that you didn't think of. So don't write the feature in first place. You ain't going to need it. Strict invariance, what you receive, you should validate it. What you return should be given as a value, as a value type, not as a mixed, not as a bool or array, not as a potato. Give it an object, whatever. Thank you very much. So just a couple things. These are practical tools that you can start tomorrow, install them into your projects, and they can make, yes, they will make your life harder, but these are actually really, really good for getting started in coding practices. Security advisories, well, it just excludes some packages. PHP stand, you probably heard of it, static analysis, coding standards that are stricter, and so on and so forth. Give it a shot, let me know. It was awesome, yeah, really. Как по мне, методичка для входящего человека в компанию просто на 5 с плюсом. Что, что не нужно делать и чего никогда в жизни лучше не делать. Так, хорошо, начнем с вопросов. Ребят, все сфотографировали, я вижу, есть руки. Давайте начнем вопросы, давайте с того крыла. Thank you very much for, for this information. And uh, it was really cool. Yeah. Uh, please tell me, um, you told us that we should not trust arguments in our functions. But also you told us that we can uh, replace them with uh, some class. Yes. But are we sure that we can trust this class? Yes, because it's a class that we wrote. But somebody can use the same interface and pass our code uh, his class. No. Should we okay, so that's think about this? Your email address is a final class with no interface. So okay, there is, thank you. There is no inheritance. The only way they can tamper with it is they can unserialize it incorrectly or they can use reflection, but then it's their problem. It's not your problem anymore. Okay, thank okay. you. Do you know do you know the way how to forbid uh, new instance creation uh, out of uh, some builders or factory? Um, yes. So okay, there is always uh, you know I write a lot of hacks for PHP, so I wrote a library called Instantiator that you can instantiate anything. It doesn't care. So regardless what you do, you already lost. But if you want to do it right, what you can do is you can make a value object. You have a protected state that is another object. And then you have a builder that inherits also from that protected object. Now you can have the builder construct that state and pass it to that other object without anybody else being able to access the properties of that state. So we can discuss it later because it's a bit contrived. Uh, but you can do it. In PHP, it will not be very type safe, but it will be, uh, it will pass, it will run, and there will be no way to instantiate your object other than with the builder, which could work. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, transactions. Uh, your example uh, uh, with transactions is uh, same uh, without it. Uh, we uh, uh, oh, we in PHP 
call the same code but have error in other place. Right. Oh, you mean you have... Um, you have we we still have uh, two method, methods, uh, but uh, we call uh, from other place. Yes, so if you have two methods calling from another place and modifying the same state, then you basically have a two-phase transaction anyway, which is a problem. So there is one very good concept from the domain-driven development kind of approach, which is called the aggregate and the aggregate root. So you can use an aggregate root, which is the only job of the aggregate is maintaining state consistent and preventing impossible mutations. You can use that concept, we can discuss it later, but it is illegal for one transaction to call more than once a method on the aggregate. That's one rule that you have to have. There is no way around it. So you can actually enforce that the aggregate will refuse two method calls within the same process. That's what you can do. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your speech. It was very exciting, uh, especially uh, for me because this is topic is very uh, important uh, for me and I try to use all this stuff during my development process except the uh, static uh, function. I, I think this is crap too. Static functions is not about OOP. Uh, but uh, one question. Uh, uh, I want to ask you about the uh, failure uh, fast or failure uh, safe. Yeah? What do you mean? Or what do you think about this kind of stuff? So um, what is the approach, the best from your point of view like uh, mm, defensive can you thing. can you declare failure fast oh failure okay okay of course for example you have try catch yeah yes so in this case you can for example hide something add to log or do some kind of an, another logic yeah during uh, the exception yeah or you can just uh, uh, fail yeah and you okay, okay so it's like uh, should uh, code be more fragile yeah or both uh, or more safe but yeah, yeah. So, what is your opinion about this? Okay, so the code, first of all, should be as type-checked as possible. So let's say that if you have a user registration, okay, what the front end would need to do is they would need to give you a valid username and a valid email address and a valid email uh, password hash before you can perform a registration. So the front end gets all the failures very, very um, f uh, at the beginning. So the, if they give you an invalid value, that will already crash for them. This will crash very early, which means smaller stack traces, which means you get easy to debug a code because the crash is immediately executed. You never go into inner layers. Um, so I prefer failing, often failing very, very eagerly. But the code needs to be as type checked as possible. In PHP, this is very hard because the language doesn't really support it. But if you start using something like PHP stun, you get rid of a lot of problems that you didn't even know you had. Um, whereas the try-catch approach should really only be used when you really accept, expect an exception. For example, your code is calling a payment gateway, and that payment gateway times out, or that payment gateway returns something that doesn't look like a good response. In that case, you want to have a try-catch in which your catch actually mutates states because it knows this could happen. But you should really only do the try catch really only when you know this could happen. Everything else should be type checked, and the front end should get the first exception. All the values should come as clean as possible. And that's where you should get the first failures. Okay. Thank you. Yep. In the middle. Uh, I have a question uh, about protected. Do you use a protected modificator? Um, almost never. So uh, the point is when you design a class, you design an interface for it. Okay? You design an API, you design an interface, then you have multiple implementations. It's really very rare that you have protected and that you have one middle concept and state that needs to be accessed by children. So this could happen very rarely if you have a concept of address, and then you have a business address, and then you have, a, 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 I don't know, a personal address, and then you have a vacation address or whatever, okay? Then you could have this inheritance, but it's still, I would duplicate the properties and the implementation rather than using um, an abstract or a class that you can extend. I would still copy-paste the code 
because I still need to write the same exact tests for all three classes. I cannot just say, oh, you know, I just tested the abstract class, so all the child implementation are going to be fine. So. Uh, at the start, you said that you have a lot of packages and uh, a lot of people who want something new feature or some fix or something like that. But in the same way, you do all efforts to uh, refuse user to extend your code. You use final, you yes. use private, and uh, maybe if you uh, leave them uh, ability to extend your code, they could do this feature by their own. That was exactly how it was. And it was terrible. Because now what happens is that everyone is extending, everyone is touching things that are not supposed to touch, or that we are not maintaining actively. Um, let me make you an example. You have an HTTP package, right? And you have the methods, HTTP method properties, which is just an array with possible HTTP methods. And then somebody in a child class decides, I'm going to override it. Now, the parent class does some parsing of the reason phrase and the HTTP code and decides what to do with it, but the child class changed it, so now the parent class has a bug because the child class changed something that it shouldn't have changed. And this happened a lot. Zen Framework 1 was a lot like this. The first versions of Zen Framework 2 were also like this. A lot of it was protected. Um, and this leads to a lot of problems. Whereas if I give you an interface, and I keep my implementation relatively simple, so I'm not asking you to write something like the doctrine unit of work. Okay, unit of work is like class with 5,000 lines of code. It's a horror. It's terrible. Okay, but we don't have a better solution for it. So if I tell you, look, this is an interface for doing exactly this thing. You can implement it by taking my code, copying it to it, not kidding, copy my code into your implementation, modify what you need, write a test that covers all of the class, you're fine. Because the interface is what matters, not the implementation. Uh, but uh, why you matter for their problems? They use your code, they extend it, and it's their responsibility. Yes, but it's my responsibility as a maintainer to provide the best possible stable solution that is not going to mess up everyone else's world. So if I make everything protected, and then I cannot change anything because everything is covered by BC policy, backward compatibility policy, I cannot do refactoring, I cannot improve performance, I cannot change anything. Every time I have to release a new version, I need to make a major version and break everyone's BC compliance. So it's a, it's a very massive problem because imagine having a package that every two months bumps a major version. Who is going to use that? Every time the development team needs to spend a week to just do an upgrade because they change everyone's API. That's not really what you want. That's too complicated. Plus. Maybe this dependency cannot be used with your package because the major version is not in the same constraint and that. So try to reduce the amount of major versions that you do. Mm -hmm. Okay, Reduce the amount of public API. Make the interfaces, so use the interface segregation principle, smaller interfaces, and the uh, open-close principle. Open-close principle is about being able to modify behavior of some code without modifying existing code. So which means you have an interface, make from the interface, make a new implementation which does exactly what you want and just plug it into the system. And that's open close principle. So that's kind of how, how you can modify an existing system without breaking everyone's uh, system. Right? And only we will finish the second presentation. For the length. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions? I'm looking for anyone. Thank you so much. Please choose.